Thank you for watching The Word and Sword brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ in Newton, North Carolina. Please feel free to call us with your Bible questions or comments about the program. Call 828-465-3009. In this episode, we have three different studies. First, we examine what the Bible teaches about God's plan of salvation. This is a topic that is greatly misunderstood because it is widely misrepresented. The doctrines of men have perverted the Bible's teaching. However, a basic study of God's Word clears up the issue and reveals the truth. Next, we continue in our series of studies on the issue of Bible authority. This lesson deals with authority as it relates to the social gospel. Many people have fallen victim to the idea that religion is recreation or entertainment or physical comfort. Study with us as we see the Bible condemns much of what we see in churches of men. Our final study in this episode is focused on an incident in the life of Christ where he encountered a demon-possessed man, a man filled with legion. In this account, we see the power and glory of our Savior as well as practical lessons for ourselves. Again, thank you for watching The Word and Sword and call us with your Bible questions at 828-465-3009. In this lesson, we want to study a very basic Bible doctrine, a fundamental doctrine about the plan of salvation, about how we go from being a sinner to being a saint. You know, Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And when we are in sin, that means we're doomed. That means we can have no fellowship with God. We cannot enter into his presence for all eternity because God is light and in him is no darkness at all. He has no fellowship with sin. So if we are in sin, if we have rebelled against him, that means we are lost and we're doomed to an eternity in hell. So how do we go from being lost to being saved, from being a sinner to being a saint? You know, we cannot figure that out on our own. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, the wise man tells us this in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. You know, men have tried to figure out for millennia how to soothe their conscience, how to get become free from guilt how to deal with life's problems and the problem of sin, how to be right with God. And they've groped. And when they follow their human wisdom, of course, they end up falling short. They end up making a disaster and a mess of things. So the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps, as Jeremiah the prophet said. No, we have to turn to God. We have to turn to his will. And let's understand that God does have a plan. God has had a plan from all eternity as to how to save man from his sins. If we go to Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, notice what the writer says here. Romans 10, verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for Israel that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Now, what the Apostle Paul is saying there is he wants all Israel to be saved, all Israelites. He wants them to enjoy what he has, redemption in Christ. But he says their problem is, though they have zeal, they're lacking knowledge. They don't allow that zeal. They're not using that zeal in a knowledgeable way, but they're ignorant of God's righteousness. It wasn't that they were ignorant of God's holiness. But as he says here, being ignorant of God's righteousness, they seek to establish their own righteousness, their own way or method or system of being righteous. And he says that's not going to work. They have not submitted to the righteousness of God. His way of making men righteous is the idea, his plan of salvation as it's described. So 
Yes, we need to know how to go from being a sinner to being a saint. And the thing is, most religious groups out there are not teaching what the Word of God teaches. If you've watched this program for any length of time, you understand that we simply try to teach what's in the Word of God, and we are very plain and very clear about the fact not everybody out there who's religious teaches what's in the Word of God. In fact, most teach error. Most teach what is not found in the Word of God. They teach the ways of men. They are like the Jews of old. They have zeal, but not according to knowledge. They have an enthusiasm. They have an energy about them, but it's not according to God's word. They go about to seek and establish their own righteousness and refuse to submit to the righteousness of God. What you and I need to be determined to do is that we accept God's righteousness. We accept his plan of saving our souls and not try to go about it in our own way. We don't accept faith alone salvation, which is unbiblical, but it's very often taught in the world around us. We don't accept works salvation, which is taught by some in the world that we can somehow do certain acts and that that makes us righteous or pays for our sins in some way, you know, acts of penance or things like that. We can't do that. Christ died and paid that price. He shed his blood so our sins may be forgiven. But because he's died for us and shed his blood for our sins doesn't mean that that forgiveness is automatically applied There are things the Bible tells us that we must do in order to be right with God. You know, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus made this simple statement in the end of the Sermon on the Mount where he said this, Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. We have to seek that righteousness. We have to seek that truth. And we have to obey that truth, submit to that, conform to that truth, submit to Jesus as our Savior, as our Lord and Master. So we understand that there is this plan of salvation revealed in the Word of God. And what we want to do going forward in our study together now is see exactly what that plan is. What is it that God has revealed? What does the Bible tell us is that plan of salvation? We'll go from some very broad concepts that you may already know and understand and accept to some very specific actions the Bible says you and I must do to go from being a sinner to being a saint. So come back in a minute as we continue in the study on the plan of salvation. As we study together about the plan of salvation, let's notice, first of all, that the Bible tells us that God sent his son into this world to redeem man from his sins. He began to reveal this to mankind all the way back in the Garden of Eden. If you recall in Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve partook of the fruit, violating God's command, the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and violated God's command, and God condemns them for that. Remember in Genesis 3, verse 15, as the Lord is speaking to the serpent there, he made this statement, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So, There's the first reference we have pointing forward to the seed of woman that would come and crush Satan and overcome him, even though Satan would inflict pain on him through bruising the heel, says that this seed of the woman would crush or bruise the head of Satan. When you get to Galatians chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4, just to tie this together in the New Testament, we know Jesus was born of Mary, born of a virgin through being conceived 
because of the power of the Holy Spirit that came upon her, so a miraculous pregnancy and a miraculous birth because she was a virgin. In Genesis, or rather Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now, it's not saying he was born of a woman because that that somehow in and of itself is an amazing thing because all children are born of women, right? And that's still true no matter what society says today, by the way. But born of a woman, what that's pointing to is born of a virgin. That's what's amazing. That's why it's worthy of note here in Galatians chapter 4, and that really is tying it back to Genesis 3, where it says he would come as the seed of a woman. He would come into this world to destroy the work of the devil. Now, if we jump back to Genesis chapter 22, Genesis chapter 22 and verse 18, as the Lord is speaking to Abraham here, this is the account where Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice, but the Lord, of course, stopped him at the last moment before he plunged the knife into Isaac. And the Lord made this promise in Genesis 22, 18. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So in your seed, we go to Galatians chapter 3 again. Galatians chapter 3 this time. And notice what the writer says about the Lord. Genesis or Galatians, I'll get this straight. Galatians 3 verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, and he does not say to seeds, or does not say and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. So see, he's the seed of the woman, but he's also the seed of Abraham. He's the seed of David, 2 Samuel chapter 6 talks about. So the Old Testament prophets foretold of the coming of the Messiah and how that through him, mankind would receive the forgiveness of sins, receive these blessings, and that the power of Satan would be destroyed, would be broken, would be overcome by the seed of woman, seed of Abraham, seed of David, who would sit and rule and reign on the throne of David. We understand that Jesus, when he came, was a sacrifice for man's sins. He is the Lamb of God. In John chapter 1, verse 29, it says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So he is that lamb, that sacrifice. Remember Isaiah 53, it talks about the suffering servant, how he come and be a sheep that is going to the slaughter, how that there would be a miscarriage of justice, how that he would be cut off out of the land of the living. So this one that Isaiah prophesied about is the one that John is telling us about in John 1, 29, how that he is the Lamb of God or the sacrifice offered up for the sins of mankind. In Matthew chapter 20, Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, let's notice this. Matthew 20, verse 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He came to be a ransom. And that concept is the idea of buying us back, that we have been kidnapped, if you will. We've been enslaved by Satan. When we enter into sin, we give into temptation, and we separate ourselves from God. We're, we're captive to Satan. But Christ came sacrificed himself, shed his blood as the price, the ransom price to buy us back, to get us out of that captivity to Satan, that we may be free in the Son of God. He gave his life a ransom for many. He shed his blood for many for the remission of sins, as he says in Matthew 26, verse 28. He did this even though you and I were rebels, even though we lived in stubbornness and opposition and rebellion 
toward the Lord. In Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, it says, For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And when he's talking about that there, he's talking about not only people of his generation, but really people that were in times past and, and coming forward that even though men transgress and fall short of the glory of God, as Romans 3.23 says, even though we do that, and the Lord knew we would do that, says he still came and gave his life for us because he loved us. He shed his blood that we may be forgiven of our sins. He was indeed the sacrifice for the sins of man. We want to come back in just a moment and notice that God has revealed his plan. Not only the things we've been talking about, but he revealed it. And he had a very specific plan for revealing that plan of salvation. So come back in just a moment and let's continue to study about God's plan of redeeming man. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828 828- 465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. Let's continue now to study on a very fundamental Bible doctrine about the plan of salvation, God's plan of salvation. And we want to look in this segment of our study at the fact that he had a plan to reveal his plan. So let's go to John chapter 14 to start with on this. As we think about the fact that the Holy Spirit revealed the plan of salvation. And Jesus taught his disciples that this was going to happen, that he would have to leave, but he would send the Holy Spirit so that they would know this plan, this gospel, this good news of saving man. In John chapter 14, verse 26, he says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So he told those apostles who were with him for three, three and a half years, they were hearing the things Jesus was teaching, but being mere men, of course, they couldn't recall everything Jesus said. So he gives them this assurance that when he left, he would send the helper, the Holy Spirit, that would bring all these things back to their mind so they could go out and teach it, so they could record it, as we have in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you will, here. We have this so that we can know about the life of Christ and the things that he taught his disciples and many others. So God sent the Holy Spirit to bring all things to remembrance that they had witnessed With Jesus. But even beyond that, in John 16, John chapter 16, verse 13, notice what it says here. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. You ever think about that? Just dwell on that a little bit? That He's telling them the Holy Spirit's going to come. And he's going to guide you into all truth. Who's the you? The you is the apostles. He's going to guide you into not some truth, not most truth, but into all truth. So what does that tell us? It tells us the Holy Spirit came and revealed all truth within the lifetime of these men. That's what it's telling us. All truth. So once all truth is revealed, what other truth 
can be revealed? Well, the answer is none, right? So you have the Holy Spirit being sent to guide them into all truth. And we know in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, that the apostle Peter tells us we've been given all things that pertain to life and godliness, that God sent the Holy Spirit so that we might know all things that are necessary to be saved, all things that are necessary to be pleasing in his sight, to honor and to glorify him. Now, these are things that were not revealed before. In the book of Ephesians chapter 3, if you just want to make a note of this, in Ephesians chapter 3, it talks about the fact that these things were a mystery before. And he talks in there, In Ephesians chapter 3, let's just pick up in verse 3. It says, How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. So these are things that were concealed and therefore mystery to men before. But Paul says, but now all these things have been revealed by the Holy Spirit to the apostles and prophets so that they could declare that gospel to mankind, which he goes on to make the point about that this included the Gentiles. So the Holy Spirit was sent to bring all things to remembrance to the men who were the disciples of Christ, who were with him in his time on earth, to bring those things to remembrance. He was sent to reveal all truth, John 16, 13. All that truth has been revealed to us. That which was once a mystery is now revealed, is known, and is knowable. So we have that in the Word of God. So the Holy Spirit revealed the truth, and then men were sent out to teach that truth far and wide. Remember, again, Mark 16, 15, where Jesus told the disciples, go into all the world, and teach the gospel to every creature. So men were sent out to declare that truth, to preach it and teach it among people far and wide throughout the world. And the Holy Spirit guided them as they went and helped them to reveal that to others. And there's something else that's very interesting in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. And it says this, And the things which you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So here's kind of the chain, if you will, going through all of this. So you have the Father revealing all things to the Son who sent the Holy Spirit to reveal all things to the apostles. Then the apostles are to teach others as Paul taught Timothy. And he tells Timothy, well, the things you hear from me, you teach others who will be able to teach others. Who will do what? Be able to teach others. And so that's how the gospel comes down through the ages. And so God has given us his word so that we can go out and teach men how they are to be saved. So that's God's plan of getting his word out there in the world. And we have that word preserved for us providentially today, and we are to take that and to teach others. And then they teach others. And then they teach others. That's the Bible plan of revealing God's plan of salvation. And we're going to come back in just a minute And notice that men are required to receive that plan of salvation. They're required to accept it. It's not just something automatically given, but something that we need to respond to. We need to act upon. So come back and let's continue to study together. We've been studying about God's plan of salvation. We've noted that God sent his son into the world and to give his life a ransom for the sins of mankind. We notice that God had a plan of revealing his plan to man, sending the Holy Spirit to guide the apostles and prophets into all truth. And then they were commissioned to go out and to teach that to others. 
And those were commissioned and are told to go and to teach others. And so the cycle goes on of spreading the truth. Well, now what we want to notice is that the salvation that is offered through Jesus Christ and is presented to us in the Word of God is not something automatically applied to the souls of men. It's not automatically applied to anyone who lives, and it's not automatically applied to anyone who just simply hears the Word of God. But there is action required. There's obedience required on the part of man to the commands that are given in the Word of God if he is to receive that salvation. Let's begin this part of our study in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. Hebrews 5, verse 9. It says here, And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. See, there are some people that are uncomfortable with this concept of obedience. And they think, well, if you try to do something, you're earning your salvation. And the Bible tells us we have to obey the Lord if we are going to be saved. And that's true whatever the command may be, because he's the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So the question has to be, what command of the Lord can I reject? Can I repudiate? Can I resist? Can I say, I'm not going to do that and I still be saved? Well, the answer is, well, there's none. Now, when I hear the command of God, I am required to obey that. I'm required to do that from, in order to go from being a sinner to being a saint, and then in order to remain in fellowship with God, I need to continue to be obedient to Him. So He's the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. And we will do that if we love Jesus, because Jesus said, John 14, 15, if you love me, Keep my commandments. If we love the Lord, we're going to keep his commandments. And what it shows is when we keep his commandments, we love him. If we don't keep his commandments, it says we don't really love him. So we must obey his will in order to receive salvation and to remain in fellowship with the Lord. In James chapter 1, James 1, verses 21 and 22, it says this, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. We have to do the word. You know, there's so many people who think, well, if I just believe in Jesus... If I just feel good about Jesus, if I'm just happy that Jesus came, if I'm just thankful that Jesus died, then that's good enough. As long as I'm sincere, I don't do too many bad things. I don't have to be really diligent, really zealous, really particular in following what's written in the Word of God. Because God knows my heart. Yeah, God does know your heart. And if you're not doing His will, He knows that. You want to do what you want to do? God knows that. So the Bible tells us that we have to be doers of the word. That's true if we want to become a child of God. We want to become a disciple. We want to go from darkness to light. That's true if we want to remain in the light. So we have to obey the gospel. We have to obey the commands of the Lord in order to be right with him, in order to have our sins forgiven, because disobedient leads to hell. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, Galatians 3, verse 1, just notice what Paul writes to the Galatian Christians, or Christians in the region of Galatia. He says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whom or before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. So when he talks here about these Galatians and he says that they have not obeyed the truth, he says, who has bewitched you? Who's put you under that spell? 
that evil spell, if you will, that you're not obeying the truth. And what he's explaining to them here is you're lost. That's your problem. You are lost. You've been separated from Christ. You jump forward to Galatians chapter 5, verse 4. Just notice what he says here. You have become estranged from Christ. See, you were with Christ, but now you are estranged from Christ. You become estranged from Christ. You attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. So you understand, he says, you've been bewitched. That means you're lost and your soul is headed to hell. In Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. And this again, he's writing to Christians. Think about this. He's writing to those who have become children of God, and he tells them this, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up wrath for yourself, wrath in the day of wrath, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds, eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. Do you see that? He says, look, there are some people who do not obey the truth. But what do they do? They obey unrighteousness. What's their condition? Indignation, wrath, tribulation, anguish. They're going to go to hell. So what does that tell us? We have to obey the truth. If we're not obeying the truth, there's only one alternative. That is obeying unrighteousness. And those who obey unrighteousness are doomed to an eternal torment. We go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians 1. And notice here, beginning in verse 7. 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7. He says, And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. That's frightening. Those who do not obey the gospel are the same ones who don't know the Lord, and they are going to be punished with everlasting destruction. That's saying they're going to lose their souls in hell. That's where disobedience leads. Obedience leads to salvation, and disobedience leads to damnation. And the Bible gives us examples of people who heard that gospel, who decided to obey because they wanted the salvation. Let's look at a couple of those very briefly here. First of all, in Acts chapter 2, you have the day of Pentecost. You have Peter preaching to the Jews who were guilty of crucifying the Christ. And this is what they say. When he tells them in Acts 2.36 that Jesus is the Lord in Christ, in Acts 2.37, this is what it says. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What do we need to do to receive salvation? How do we fix this problem of us killing the Christ? So what shall we do? And notice Peter does not come back with do. There's nothing for you to do. You believe Jesus is the Christ, you're good to go. He doesn't tell them that. They believe Jesus is the Christ, or they wouldn't have asked what to do. So what does he tell them to do? Acts 2.38, Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what you do. You repent and be baptized. You repent and you're buried in water. You rise up to walk in newness of life, as Romans chapter 6 puts it. You repent and be baptized. That's what you need to do. So there's a Bible example. Notice in 
Acts chapter 6, verse 7, it says that the word of God spread and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Well, we understand Acts 2, what that means, what they were doing. They believed Jesus was the Christ. They repented of their sins. They were baptized. They were obedient to the faith, to the faith, that truth that was being revealed. In Acts chapter 8, Acts 8, you have a couple of accounts here. You have the Samaritans and you have the Ethiopian eunuch in the latter part of the chapter. But just notice Acts 8 verse 5 beginning. Acts 8 verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was a great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. Now, verse 12, Acts 8, verse 12. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. You see that? The exact pattern that we've seen elsewhere, the exact pattern that we've seen when we talked about the plan that God put into place and how he revealed that to the apostles and prophets and they were to go preach it. Here is Philip, the evangelist, going out and declaring that. And it says, he taught them concerning the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, it says that Simon believed and was baptized. So you understand that these people are hearing the gospel, they're obeying the gospel, they're obeying that truth that leads to salvation. We could go on through the book of Acts and we could cite different places within the word of God where this pattern is repeated again and again. When you put it all together, you see that people need to hear the word of God. They need to believe that word. They need to confess Jesus as the Christ. They need to repent of their sins and they need to be baptized for the remission of their sins. That is the basic gospel message of how men are to be saved. The plan that God put in place so that through the sacrifice of his son, through the blood that was shed by the Lamb of God, they could receive the benefits of that blood. They can receive the blessings that are found in that blood and be redeemed from their sins to go from being a sinner to being a saint, from being in darkness to being in light. We hope you will consider this because this is not something that is taught among many religious groups. In fact, most don't teach anything like this. They teach what men have decided that others should do to be saved. They've added to her, they've taken from the word of God, but we understand that that is sinful. So the word of God reveals very plainly, very basically what we must do, what the plan of salvation is. We encourage you to think on that, to study about it. If you have questions, if you have objections, let us know. We want to be able to study with you, to talk with you, about what is revealed so that we together can serve God faithfully and honor him. And in the end, together have a home in heaven. So thank you for studying with us. If you have questions, please reach out and let us know. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465 3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828 465 
3009. We continue in our series of studies on the subject of authority, specifically Bible authority. And we want to recall that we've studied several principles on this subject, including the need for authority, the two types of authority, which are generic and specific, generic being inclusive within a class or a category of things, specific authority being exclusive within a class or category of things. And then also we've noted three ways of establishing Bible authority. The three ways are direct statements, approved examples, and necessary inferences or necessary conclusions that are drawn off of direct statements or approved examples. So what we want to do in this study is move on into some practical applications in the church, how the church functions, what the church may do as we think about authority relative to the issue of the social gospel. And we want to begin with this thought in mind that if we love Jesus, we must keep his commandments. In John 14, verse 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So if we appreciate Jesus and what he has done for us, the sacrifice that he's given for us, and how he has loved us and offered us redemption and eternal life, then we are obligated and we are bound to keep his commandments, to live by his will. In John 14, or rather 15, verse 20, he said, Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So a couple of things out of that is, first of all, Jesus says that he is a master. So for to his disciples, he is Lord. So if we say that Jesus is Lord of our life, then we are obligated to follow him, to submit to him in all things. And he says here very explicitly, if they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So if we acknowledge Jesus as Lord, we not only do what he says, what's revealed about his teaching specifically in the New Testament, but we will also honor and respect the word that was taught through the apostles and prophets. We will respect the fact that they are representatives or ambassadors of Christ, and they were guided by the Holy Spirit to reveal all things to us. So if we love Jesus, we believe he is Lord, then we must keep his commandments, because we understand, as he stated in Matthew 28, 18, that he has all authority in heaven and on earth, and we have to respect that authority. We have to respect the fact that he is the one who has the right to command us, and he's the only one who has the right to command us in religious matters. If it's not authorized in his word, then we cannot do that. So we want to study that tonight and think about this in 2 John 9. In 2 John verse 9, the apostle reveals there that we have to abide within the doctrine or the teaching of Christ. He says in 2 John 9, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. So it reveals to us here that this doctrine of Christ is a fixed system, a fixed body of truth, if you will. It's, it's definite. It's identifiable. You can know it. You can understand it. And you must live within that. You must abide in that doctrine. Because if you don't, if you transgress it, you go outside of it, you don't have God. You don't have fellowship with God. But if you abide within it, you live within it, you submit your life to it and allow your life to be governed by it, then you have both the Father and the Son. So we have to respect the authority of our Lord. And we are not free to add to or to take from 
what has been revealed in Revelation 22, 18 and 19. As John is closing out the revelation here, he states a principle that is directly applicable to the book of Revelation, but it is generally applicable as well to all revealed truth, to all the revelation of God. In Matthew, or rather Revelation 22, verse 18, he says, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the word to the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life and from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So we have to respect that authority, respect that we cannot decide what we want to do. We can't add to God's word because we think it sounds good or it feels good, or even because it, quote, works, we have to abide within it because the Lord has all authority. And we want to apply this again to the social gospel. And what we're talking about is evangelism and edification within those realms revealed in the New Testament. Men have taken this and they've decided that they want to change things up, that they want to add things into evangelism and edification to the work of the church in order to bring more people in or to keep the people who are already there. So let's open up our Bibles together. Let's study from the Word of God on this subject of authority, applying the principles we've studied before to this subject of the social gospel, thinking about evangelism and edification. We're going to come back in just a moment, and we want to go back to an Old Testament account and go through a command that God had given to one of his servants and how these principles apply, and then we'll move forward into the New Testament and see how it applies to the church. So come back and let's study more together. As we continue on in our study in authority relative to what's called the social gospel, let's back up to Genesis chapter 6 and notice the account of Noah and the command that God gave him to build the ark and some specifics related to that command and then how they apply to the subject of authority. And then we'll take those lessons and come into the New Testament and do some more application to see what is authorized and what is not authorized relative to the church's work in evangelism and edification. So to start with, in Genesis chapter 6, in verses 1 through 13, if we read down through these verses, we see that the world in which Noah lived was a very wicked and evil world. And it became so bad that God decided he was going to destroy all life on earth, all that which crawled upon or walked upon, lived upon the face of the earth, all those that breathe air, if you will. And thus he made this decision, but there is one man and his family who found grace in the eyes of God. And that man, of course, was Noah. And so God gave Noah a command to build the ark so that he and his family and a certain set of animals could be spared of that. So let's notice this in Genesis chapter 6, beginning in verse 14. Let's go ahead and, and grab 13 as well. But we want to begin reading in 13, and let's read all the way down through 7, verse 3, just to get all these details that are revealed in here. So Genesis 6, verse 13. It says, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood, Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. 
You shall make a window for the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubit from above, and set the door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your son's wives, with you. And of everything of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. And you shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself and it shall be food for you and food for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven of each and are each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female, also seven each of birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth. And so we read down through there how God gives this command to Noah to build the ark, and he gives some very specific things related to the building of that ark, and then he talks about the animals that would go into it, of course. So he's commanded to do these things here. And what we want to notice is some of these things that the Lord lists out here. First of all, we notice that he tells them to make an ark of gopher wood. So he tells them the type of material that the ark is to be built from. And then he goes on and tells him the dimensions of that ark how long it should be, how wide it should be, how tall it should be. He tells him he's to make it three decks. So what does the interior look like? How is that going to be built out? And then he gives, of course, the command about the animals, two of the unclean and seven of the clean will come to you and they are to go into the ark so that they survive the flood as well to to preserve those species or those animals and the birds and various things. So he gives them all these things, right? Now, when we look at that, what do we learn about authority? What is here? Because there is a lot about authority in this, and we can learn a lot of lessons that we're then going to jump forward and apply in just a moment to evangelism and edification to the church, you have the ark here. We're going to talk about the church in just a little bit. But he's commanded to build this ark, again, of gopher wood. That is a specific type of wood. Okay, whatever that wood was, it was specific. And when it was specifically mentioned that it was to be gopher wood, that meant any other kind of wood was excluded. So... It's not pine, it's not oak, it's not cherry, it's not elm, it's not birch. It's not all these other kinds of woods that we may find, no matter what we may like. It's not even cedar, if you will. You know, cedar smells nice, or most people think cedar smells nice. But Noah couldn't decide, well, you know what? I want to go into that ark, and I want to have me a room, maybe a closet, with cedar in it because it'll smell so nice and it'll preserve our garments, things like that. No, God said, make the ark of gopher wood. That means every other kind of wood was to be excluded from the ark. Now, let me ask you this question. Did God have to tell Noah, well, Noah, I want you to make the ark of gopher wood, but don't make it of pine, don't make it cherry, Don't make it birch. Don't make it cedar. Don't make it oak. Did he have to come along and say, don't make, and then list out all those other types of wood that existed? Or did God, was it sufficient for him to say, make it of gopher wood? And no understood. Okay, I make it of gopher wood. If the Lord had told him to make it of pine, 
Well, then he would need to make it of pine. If he told him to make it of oak, then he'd need to make it of oak. You see, he told Noah, make it of gopher wood. Noah understood it, and you understand it, I understand it. That means every other kind of wood is excluded from the materials to make the ark. Now then, there is a generic aspect to this command as well. When he says to make the ark of gopher wood, Well, where does he get the gopher wood? Where is it that he is to go and to harvest that wood? Was it close? Was it somewhere far away? Was it in a valley? Was it on the side of a mountain? Was it on a flat piece of land where there was a stand of gopher wood or gopher wood lying on the ground or wherever it might be? You know, where was he to get the wood? That's left to Noah. Now, he had to get gopher wood, but where to get that gopher wood? God doesn't tell him where to get it. He just tells him to get it. Now, how does he transport it? Does he transport it by cart? Does he have oxen or donkeys or something to pull that? Does he transport it on water and float it down? Does he float it across a lake or down a river or something like that? Do he and his son simply get it and drag it? to where they're going to begin to use that wood, manipulate that wood, things like that? Where is he to store it? Is he to pile it up? Is he to go and get it as he needs it? You know, that is not specified. So when he told him to make the Ark of Gopher Wood, that gopher wood is exclusive. It's specific. But make is rather generic. Where he would get it, how he would bring it to where he's going to work on it, whether he would store it or get it as he needed it, uh, what length to cut the planks. You know, does he cut them 10 feet long, 20 feet long, 50 feet long, or maybe we should say five cubits, 10 cubits, 20 cubits. You know, how, how long does he make the planks that are going to go into building that big boat? It's not given. It's So it's a generic aspect of that command. Now, God told him very specifically the dimensions of the ark. So he told him to make it 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. So he gave him very specific things about that. But again, you know, the size of the planks are generic. Whether he made them, you know, 10 cubits long and 10 inches wide or 20 inches wide, or however he did that, that's not given, but the dimensions are given. So Noah could not make it 400 cubits long and 20 cubits wide and 10 cubits high. He couldn't change those things around. Otherwise, you know, and I know that ark never would have floated. If he disobeyed God, if he decided to do it his way, then God would not have blessed him. But it tells us that Noah did according to all that God commanded him. So he made it 300 by 50 by 30 because that's what God had specified and he had no right to change it. Now, generically, when it says to make it these dimensions, you know, you've got tools, all kinds of tools. What types of tools did he use? What, you know, how big is the saw that he would use or the hammer? What type of hammer is he going to use? Does it have a metal or iron head on that hammer? Does it have a a rock head on it? Does it have a wooden head? If he's, you know, driving wooden stakes to help hold that together, you know, exactly what kind of hammer, how many tools does he have? Uh, Where to build it? Does he build it near his home? Does he build it near the water? Does he build it up on a high peak? Where does he build this thing? Well, that's not given, but we know that he had to pick somewhere to build that ark. So he had some generic things where he had freedom to make choices, but there are other things that are specified. He doesn't have freedom to change that or to do what would please him. He had to do it exactly as God commanded him to do. So when you think about that statement of make an ark of gopher wood and 300 
cubits by 50 cubits by 30 cubits, you understand that there is the authority of God in there. And there are certain things Noah could do, certain things Noah could not do. There are inferences in there. When he said, make an ark of gopher wood, that means he had to get the wood somewhere. That means he had to cut the wood, manipulate the wood, somehow uh, get that wood into the shape of this ark that he's going to make, into the dimensions of the ark that he's going to make. He had to somehow go in there and make second and third decks and support those decks for those animals to live in, for his family to live in while they were in that ark. So there are some things that we understand are necessarily inferred in the direct statement that God gave in commanding him to go and to make this ark. So there's the principles of authority when you look at Noah building the ark per God's commandment. And what we want to do is come back in just a moment and notice these same principles at being used when it comes to the church and the subject of evangelism edification and what some people have described as the social gospel. So again, we invite you to have your Bible open. Let's come back and study on this some more in just a moment. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. Before we continue on, I want to pause for just a moment and think about this. It is such a blessing to have the Word of God reveal to us these principles of authority and how it is we can understand what God wants and what God does not want, what is acceptable, what is unacceptable. It's so good to have that clarity so we can know how to please Him and have fellowship with Him so we can have confidence that what we're doing, what we believe, what we practice is right. Because if we look into the world around us and we see what men say and what men do, there's all kinds of confusion because you look into the world and you realize very quickly, well, people are just doing what they want to do, what pleases them. And then you have that nagging question, well, is this right? Should I be doing this? Does this please God? And without principles of authority, without that foundational concept that we've been studying about in the Word of God, it creates doubt. And doubt is something that the devil uses to cause us to turn against God. So, Let's be thankful that we have in the Bible these principles of authority revealed to us that we can know what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's evil. So let's continue on now as we study that subject of authority related to evangelism and edification and what is also called the social gospel. We want to begin thinking about this relative to the church and understanding the church has a work to do, but to start with a very basic concept that the church is people, right? The church is really not the building. Uh, that's a structure. And I know we call buildings churches, but the Bible tells us that the church are the people, the called out. It literally is those who are called out, called out of the world is the idea. But in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, it says, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So he's writing to those who are Christians, those who are saints, and he tells them you're being built up a spiritual house that church that belongs to God. In verse 9, he says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we understand that the church, 
made up of people, a spiritual house, a holy nation devoted to God. So it's individuals who have committed their life to Christ. And in Ephesians chapter 2, it very specifically talks about this idea of the saints being a building, if you will. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, he says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So when he says this building, he's not referring to a physical structure. In here he's talking about those who make up the church that belongs to God, those who make up the household of God. And so thinking about that, thinking about those people need to respect the authority of Jesus Christ, how is it that people get into that church? How is it that people become a part of the household of God, a part of that holy nation? How is it that they become living stones how, how does that happen? How do they go from being sinners to being saints, if you will? Well, the Bible tells us that it's through teaching. It's through the Word of God being taught, being accepted, being applied, being submitted to in the lives of men and women. And in Matthew chapter 28, we want to notice this. Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19, Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Verse 20 now, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So notice the process here. He says, Go and make disciples. And that idea in Mark 16, verse 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He does not believe will be condemned. He's saying the same thing here, different words, a little different angle as all the uh, gospel accounts give us just a little bit different sense of how things were presented. But let's understand this. He says, go make disciples. And that means you have to teach them because disciples are pupils. Disciples are learners. Well, they're going to learn the gospel. He says, you make disciples through teaching them, baptizing them, and then you teach them to observe all things. Notice John chapter 6. In John 6, Jesus is speaking to Jews there and In part, he has rebuked them for seeking carnal things, seeking the food that would fill their belly instead of seeking spiritual things, the things that really mattered. In John chapter 6, notice verses 44 and 45, because Jesus gives us the exact formula of how men are drawn to God. You know, some people think it's this mystical, unknown, you just don't really understand how it happens. Jesus says, here's how it happens. In John 6, verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Okay, the Father draws him. Well, how does the Father draw him? How is it that I can participate in the last day and being raised up by the Lord? No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now, verse 45, it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Notice again, verse 44, no one can come to me lest the Father draws him. In verse 45, he says, well, they're going to be taught, they're going to hear, they're going to learn from the Father and come to me. So it's through hearing and learning the Word of God that men are drawn to the Lord. That's how they are added to the church. When they hear, they learn. It's not just understanding that Jesus is the Christ. The demons believe and tremble. 
There are many in the New Testament who believed in Jesus, but were fearful of confessing him because of the Jewish leaders and what would happen to them. So it's not just believing, it's not just learning, it's not just understanding, but it's truly submitting to the will of God is the idea that he's presenting to us here. Notice in 1 Peter chapter 1, again, we go back to 1 Peter, this time now, chapter 1, and see what Peter says relative to the gospel, to the idea of teaching, and what it does for a man's soul. In 1 Peter 1 verse 22, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. He says you're born again through the word of God, that you obey the truth. That's how you have purified your souls. You see how all of this goes together? Jesus says, go make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all things. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized, he who hears and obeys, right? How people are drawn to him is through hearing and learning. That is accepting the truth really applying that truth. Here he says that they purify their souls in obeying the truth. In John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus put it this way, that that if you, um, I, I'm misquoting it here. Let me get to John 8, 32, so I don't misquote it. I should be able to quote this just right off. But John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So, you know that truth, it makes you free. Free from what? Free from sin. Free from unrighteousness. Now, when you jump down to John 8, 31, the, the previous verse, I should say jump up one verse. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. You see, if we want to be a disciple of Christ, Again, as we talked about before, we have to abide in his word. We have to remain within his word, live within it, apply that in our lives. So we know the truth. The truth makes us free. The truth purifies our souls. We're born again through the gospel. You see how all that goes together? We have to hear it. We have to believe it. We have to submit to it. That's the idea. That's how people are added to the church. And we'll go to one specific example in Acts chapter 2. Acts 2, if you recall how that Acts 2 is a record of the day of Pentecost after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, how that the Jews are gathered there, the apostles are in Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit comes down and the apostles begin to preach to the people who are there in Jerusalem. And they teach that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. In John, or rather Acts 2, verse 36, Peter tells the crowd there that, Therefore, let all of the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made the Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, See, how is it that people are going to be drawn to Christ? When they hear and they learn. Now, when they heard this, Acts 2.37, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is the Christ. They're cut to the heart when they heard that, and they ask, what do we need to do? So they've heard and they've learned to some degree that there's something they need to do. They ask what to do. Peter says, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Now jump down to verse 47. It says at the end of verse 47, and the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. So see how people are added to the church? See how they become a part of the church of Jesus Christ? How is it that evangelism takes place? How is it that people in the world go from being in the world 
into the kingdom? How do they go from being in darkness to being in the light as we read about in 1 Peter chapter 2? How does that happen? How do they become a part of that holy nation? They are taught, they learn, they apply that. And when they do that, it says they are saved and the Lord adds them to the church, right? You hear, you believe Jesus is the Christ, you repent of your sins, you're baptized, your sins are forgiven, and at that point is when the Lord adds you to his church. So teaching is the method, is the vehicle for reaching the lost and bringing them to the Lord. That's what the Bible tells us. That's how men are to be drawn to Christ. So let's understand that the church now has this authority to go out and to evangelize and to teach people. They have the authority to teach orally, if you will. Maybe it's one-on-one and someone is sitting down at a table and and teaching other people about the gospel of Christ. Maybe they're standing in a pulpit or in front of a crowd, and they're speaking that. They're teaching it. So it could be orally. It could be on the radio. It could be the internet. It could be a podcast. could be on television. There are many different ways that it could be orally delivered. It could be delivered in a written form. It can be written, you know, in a paper, in a magazine. It could be written just on a regular sheet of paper. It could be written in a bulletin or a track or written on the internet or put up on signs in different places. So it can be written in many different ways. It can be a case where the church supports a preacher to go out and to declare the gospel either orally or written that he can go out and he can reach the lost. Remember in Philippians chapter 4, Philippians 4, you have an example here of how the Apostle Paul was able to teach in part because of the help that the Philippians had given him in Philippians 4 verse 15. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. So he says, you sent to me support financially so I can carry out my work in teaching the gospel. And he says, I'm not seeking that material good that those those monies that you sent me but I'm really seeking the gift that abounds to your account I'm seeking to save men's souls and the Lord's going to put that down on your account it's not just Paul involved in that so just the point of a church can support a man going out and teaching the gospel it could be teaching locally even teaching nationally throughout a nation or internationally, going overseas or to foreign countries. Uh, It could be one preacher. It could be many different preachers, but they can support that. That's evangelism and teaching the Word of God. But there's also the idea of edifying the saints. Uh, Back in Ephesians chapter 4, let's notice this. Ephesians 4. This is a really good passage to look at and think about how is the church built up? How is this church strengthened? How is the church drawn together even? How does that happen? In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, it says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now stop right there and notice verse 11 again. Notice the things that he mentions or the individuals that he mentions there. When he says he gave some to be apostles and prophets, what was their duty? What was their primary responsibility in life? Was to teach the word of God. He talks about evangelists and pastors and teachers. See, all these things, all these roles are teaching roles to inform people about God's will, 
So he says they were for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, the building up of the body of Christ, the strengthening of the body of Christ, which is another way of strengthening, building up the church of Christ. Till we come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. The word of God, the teaching of that word, is how the church is built up, how it's edified, how it's strengthened, how it is held together in unity in Christ. That's how it is done. So, The church is authorized to teach the lost and is authorized to teach the saved. Both saint and sinner need the word of God in order to be in fellowship with God. And edifying the saints can take place in Bible classes, can take place in sermons, can take place church bulletins, church websites, all kinds of things similar to what we've already discussed. But the idea is, is the teaching of the word that draws men to Christ and keeps them in Christ. And all these things that we've talked about respect the bounds of the authority of the Word of God, right? They respect the fact that he says, go teach the gospel. How you draw men to me is you teach them. They hear, they learn, and they come to me. Now, what we're going to do in just a moment is come back to look at ways that men use to draw people in and to keep people in churches. And these things that we're going to notice are not in the Word of God. They're not authorized by God's Word, but they go beyond the doctrine of Christ. They transgress the doctrine of Christ. So again, come back with your Bible, and let's continue in this study. Okay, we come to the last segment of our study on authority as it relates to the social gospel. And we hope you've been following along with us down through this study to this point. If not, you can go back and watch the previous portions on video on our website and you'll be able to catch up to where we are now because it's very important to understand the principles behind what we're about to say. We understand that there is authority through direct statements, approved examples, and necessary inferences, that there's both generic and specific authority. We saw how that applied to Noah building the ark. And when God said, build it of gopher wood, it ruled out all other kinds of woods. When he said to build it you know, 300 by 50 by 30, it ruled out any other dimensions that Noah might have wanted to use. So there is specific authority that excludes things, while there's also generic authority that includes many different things. It would include the tools, right? Go make an ark of gopher wood. So the types of tools or where Noah obtained the gopher wood, where he built the ark. So those things were generic. Now, when we fast forward to the New Testament and we talk about the subjects of evangelism and edification, what we've already noticed is that there's specifics that the Bible tells us about of evangelism edification that people need to be taught the word. That's how they're drawn to Christ. That's how they're kept close to Christ. So that's specific in that. And that rules out other ways of drawing people to the Lord, of bringing them in or keeping them. And generically, we understand 
that teaching can be done in many different ways. It can be oral, it can be written, it can be on the internet, it could be audio only. There could be all kinds of different ways that the teaching is done, that the communication is done in different formats, different settings, things like that. But here's the thing we want to understand, that there are people who have gone beyond what the Bible authorizes to do things that please them that seem appealing to them or that work, if you will. Their idea is, well, if it draws a big crowd, then it must be okay. Then it must be God moving among us. And that is not the case because plenty of people can do things that are unrighteous and ungodly and draw massive crowds of people. But that's not what the New Testament teaches that's not the way the church is to function or to operate in order to bring people to the Lord for salvation, to make him master of their life. So we want to understand that there is no authority in the Word of God for what's called the social gospel. People decided at some point along the way, and this really started the late 19th century in very, what we might say, very mild forms. Instead of attending to the needs of man's soul, they began to attend to the whole needs of man, and they began to look more on the outward man than the inward, and began to minister to his body versus ministering to his soul. And so that has developed over the decades now, and people do all kinds of things to draw people in and to keep them in a specific religious group. So churches use things like um, entertainment in order to draw people in, and they might have dramas that they put on, plays. They might have comedians in that really make people laugh, and uh, they might have bands that come and play, and they have full-on concerts. I mean, there's some, you may have witnessed them, maybe you've been in a service like this. I've seen clips of these things online. You, you couldn't tell a church service from the average rock concert. You just couldn't tell the difference. Just looking at it and seeing what's going on, it's very, very strange to, to think about that. And if you're old enough to think back away uh, many years of how churches were reverent in their worship compared to how they're now raucous in their worship. And they use this because it draws a crowd because it's so exciting. Now, understand that they do things that give it a religious flavor you know, they might have a religious theme or they might have Bible um, ideas or concepts within these things, but they've gone from teaching to entertaining. And I think we very often can see the difference between those two. Now, good teaching is something that is interesting, no doubt, but it's not entertaining. It's not a entertainment, primary entertainment um, mechanism. That's not it. But see, they've changed it to be primarily entertaining. And the secondary object of it is to be informative in some way, if it's even informative at all. Re usually it's just making people feel good about being there. Now, there's also social services or material benefits that many churches offer, like they might offer a hair salon or a workout center, fitness center. Uh, they might have job counseling or job placement services, uh, oil changes. I've seen that being offered at churches. So there's all kinds of things like that that they, they do to draw people in. And they offer recreational things, things that are Fun, right? They might offer ball teams, um, 
They might have a full gymnasium where kids or even adults can go and and play different types of sports. Uh, they might have parties. They might have game rooms. You know, I've known of churches where they have a game room. Basically, it's just a big arcade. And they might have, you know, pool tables, ping pong tables, foosball, all those kinds of things. They've got all that in there to draw people in, to draw a crowd, to keep that crowd as they are there. And then they lure people sometimes with bribes. And when I say bribes, I mean, literally, they are offering people essentially to pay them to come and to be a part of their worship, to attend their worship. They offer free food. They offer raffles where people come in and they actually gamble or maybe they give these things away, but they give them little tickets, you know, you, you come in, you attend, you get a ticket that day, they're going to draw a winner at the end of services. That's how they get you to stay for services. I mean, think about the kind of people that they're drawing with that. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but, um, you know, they give away things. They, they give away cars. They give away houses. I've seen that before. Um, bicycles, motorcycles, they, they give away all kinds of goodies because people want goodies. People want free stuff. And so if it draws people in, hey, let's give it away. There are some places that actually have given visitors cash to come and to attend their service. Now, of course, their idea is that what's worked out is a lot of people give that back in the offering. So it may be a zero-sum game, something like that. So they're not out a lot. But, I mean, the, just the concept of offering people money to attend the worship service, that's just appalling. That's degrading the religion of Jesus Christ. All these things are. To think that this is what the religion of Christ has been reduced to. Christ did not die on the cross so young people could play basketball. He didn't die on the cross so people could eat pizza or to have a concert. You know, he didn't die on the cross for those things. He died on the cross to save people's souls, and people have perverted that in the extreme in his name, and it is an abomination before God. You know, so where's the authority for all those things? Where's the statement you would look at in the Word of God? Where's the example? Where would you necessarily infer, hey, here's the things we need to do? Because the things we've been talking about, they didn't come out of the Bible. They came out of the imaginations of the hearts of men. You know, the social gospel in the church is like Noah using pine or oak or even adding another boat. You know, imagine if Noah said, well, Lord, I know you told me to build this great big boat to put all these animals in it, and I'm going to be on there, and my wife and my sons and my daughters-in-law, we're all going to be on there with those animals. But there's some animals that we don't want to be around, we don't want to have to deal with, uh, for instance, a skunk. And so we want to make us a little boat. And let's put the skunks on that little boat. We'll tie it to the ark. But we think that would be better. Would that work for Noah to make a skunk boat? But see, that's what people are doing when they decide to change what's revealed in the Word of God. They try, try to change that pattern. They're doing something like Noah would do if he tried to add another boat because he thought it would work or it would be a good idea. So we want to make sure that we're not people who disrespect the authority of Jesus Christ. We need to respect that he's told us that we draw people to Christ through the teaching of the gospel, that we draw people to Christ through the gospel that would allow them to be set free, that they would know the truth, and that that truth would make them free. We have to respect the authority in the Word of God. And when we do that, we will have clarity on God's will. We will have confidence that we're doing 
what pleases him and not simply following the latest fad, following the latest trend. <clears throat> Excuse me, because when people offer these things and you've seen it, if you've watched religions, you've watched these religious bodies, you've seen this happen, that there's a church that offers the latest and greatest and most exciting thing in program and people begin to gravitate there. But then there comes another one that offers something new and exciting and different. And then people gravitate over there. And so it's just from one to the other. And now you see all these churches that are playing catch up, playing competition with each other. There's been a lot of changes over the past few decades and how you, you see this happening and people going from the one shiny object to the next shiny object, one exciting thing to the next exciting thing. And that's a never ending cycle. The word of God's not like that. It's steadfast, it's steady, it's reliable, it's consistent. And no, it's not the most uh, shiny new object, but it's the old Jerusalem gospel. It is that soul-saving gospel. And that's what we need to go to. That's what we need to respect in order to help men's souls to be saved, in order to save our own souls and to glorify God while we are here on earth and live with him in eternity. If you have questions about this, if you have a disagreement, reach out to us. Let us know. We'd be happy to study with you so that we have an agreement on the word of God. Because if we're mistaken, we need to be corrected and we invite that. And so reach out to us. Let's study our Bibles together. Let's be committed to loving the Lord and keeping his commandments and honoring him in all that we do. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. When we allow Satan into our lives, he slowly takes control and eventually he fills us. Little by little, he'll tempt us, he'll persuade us to commit sin and then another sin and then different types of sin. And so little by little, he'll creep into our lives, he'll creep into our hearts and our minds until we are filled with sin. Now, at first, it seems like this is good, this is pleasurable, this is enjoyable, this is exciting. But as time goes on, that life of sin really becomes a time of misery, of sorrow, of pain, and of guilt, of regret. And so when Satan takes over our lives, we end up with lives that are difficult and oppressive. And when we are this way, we're not in our right mind because the Bible teaches us that we were created to have fellowship with God. We were created to live righteously before our maker in heaven. And when we live in sin, we're living really contrary to our nature. Now, we can become very comfortable in it. We can become used to it. We can have a heart that is callous, that is hardened. And we crave that sin. We understand that we can become addicted to sin, so to speak. But really, ultimately, is it against the way that we have been made, against our very nature? Because again, we are to have fellowship with God. We want to see an example of sin or of Satan controlling our lives in Mark chapter 5, where Jesus encounters a man that is demon-possessed. And in Mark 5, verse 1, we want to begin reading this. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains. 
because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about two thousand. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. You know, the account here of this demon-possessed man is a concrete or physical manifestation of what it's like when the devil enters into your life and destroys your life and makes your life a life of misery. When you read the parallel accounts, you go to the book of Matthew. Matthew mentions two men that Jesus encounters here, but Mark and Luke only mention one, and that's probably because this is the case of greater demon possession. Of course, you have legion here. The other accounts normally we read of one demon possessing an individual, but here it talks about this legion, which means thousands of demons is the idea that are possessing this man. And when we see this, we need to think about, you know, when sin is in us, we have the devil in us, if you will. His demons are controlling us, and they are wreaking havoc in our life. And so there is a spiritual element or a spiritual lesson to be drawn out of these things. And that is the first thing that we really want to concentrate on for a few moments is the fact that life with demons is indeed torture. Notice again what this man said or what it says of this man as Jesus encounters him, and it talks about the fact that he's living among the tombs. He's living in a place that's away from civilization, away from the living, where people would normally want to be in a place where there is death, there is corruption, Um, So he's out there isolated from the rest of society. And while he is out there and living in that condition, it talks about the fact that he cries out and he would cry out day and night or night and day. And even in verse five, it says that he would cut himself with stones. So he's out there. He has no home. He's not wearing clothes. It talks about that he is naked as he is out there. And of course, he is violent because it talks about how they go and they try to bind him with chains and he would break those chains off and no man could tame him. And it seems obvious that the people are afraid of him, which is easy to understand. Somebody who's behaving like this is odd and you're not sure exactly what they're going to do. But it gives us an idea of what it's like to live in sin and live in unrighteousness in league with the demons. They're 
is all kinds of difficulty in our lives when we do that. When you look in the book of James, James chapter 3 and verse 13 beginning, the wise man here says this, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. So it tells us that when we have these sins in our lives, and he names some specific ones, the bitter envy, the self-seeking, we lie, we don't speak the truth, uh, those types of things. He says that that is a demonic nature or of demonic character. It's not that we are literally demon-possessed like the man in Mark chapter 5 is, but that means we're in league with the demons and it's the devil who's controlling our life. Down in James chapter 4 verse 4, he talks about where, or verse 1, where do wars and fights come from among you? Where, Where do you get all that turmoil in your life? Well, it comes from living in sin and unrighteousness. And so people who do that, and you, you see the misery that they're in, sometimes they try to fix that themselves and they turn to things of the world, remedies of the world. They begin to abuse themselves. They might abuse themselves with alcohol or with drugs or even cutting themselves as this demon-possessed man did to himself. But people do that because they're trying to get rid of the pain and sometimes the idea is, well, if I just have enough physical pain, it may remove this emotional pain. Or if I can just deaden that emotional pain through intoxication in some way. And that is a life of misery, being possessed by those things, being controlled by those things. Now, this man also, we understand, has no shame as he's going about naked. And people very often when they're caught up in sin, they have no shame. They uncover themselves. They go out uh, naked or what we might say half naked into society. And they run around and they allow themselves to be put on display for others to gawk at and to lust after. So there's no dignity. There's no self-respect there. There's no modesty to them. And that's what it's like to be controlled or to be led by the devil. Uh, They're violent. They are unrestrained in their emotions. They have wrath and violent outbursts, and they may break things or maybe even physically strike other people, or their mouth um, is very abusive and very hurtful toward others because they have that violent nature, that wrath that's been stirred up in them. That's very similar to what we see with this man here as he was literally demon-possessed when we are possessed by the devil or controlled by the devil. We act in a very similar way, and it talks about that this man was not in his right mind, both here in Mark and in Luke 8, 35. He was not in his right mind. And when we live in sin, we are not in our right mind. We are not the way we ought to be thinking, the way that we ought to think. And just as we would look on this man here with pity and compassion and think how terrible it would be to be like that, we need to see that in our own condition when we are living in sin and truly look at ourselves and realize that when we are following Satan, and when we are allowing him to direct and control our lives, we are in a terrible and pitiful condition. This man could not do anything about it himself, and we cannot do anything about it ourselves. But we have to turn to the Lord, and we understand that when we do turn to him, that that misery, that sorrow, that pain, that suffering can be lifted out of our life, that guilt that comes along with sin and many of the consequences of sin um, can be taken away from the fact that we're not living it any longer. There may still be things we have to face because of our previous actions, but 
at least it stops that cycle at that point of adding more and compounding more of those miseries, of those problems in our lives. But we go back now to Mark chapter 5, and notice when you read through the story, and the demon-possessed man sees Jesus, even from afar off, he runs and he worships him. That's the idea. He runs and he bows down before him, and he acknowledges Jesus as the Son of the Most High God. I implore you, he said, that you do not torment me. And what this shows us is that the demons were powerless in the presence of Christ. They recognize his great power, that he has control over them and the right to command and to direct them. And so they come in a submissive way before the Lord. And they are those who believe and tremble. And here's the thing. They are doomed even though they believe that Jesus is the Son of the Most High God. You know, James, in James chapter 2, talks about that the demons believe and tremble. Well, they're doomed. And the reason that they're doomed, even though they believe, is because they do not submit to the will of the Lord in their lives. They do not follow his directions, but they live in rebellion toward him. And today we understand there are people who believe that Jesus is the Christ, but they live in rebellion toward him. They do not submit fully and completely to his will. And so they're no different than these demons. They're doomed because they do not submit to his will, even though they may believe. But they are powerless before Christ, and they ask his permission to go into the swine. He grants that permission. About 2,000 swine are filled with these demons, and they run down the hill and go into the Sea of Galilee, and they drown there. And that's just simply Jesus allowing that to happen so people who witness this see how great that demon possession was, that there were thousands of demons in this man, and it's seen in the swine as they are um, filled with the demons, and they run down that hill and die in the water. They drown in the water. Now, here's the thing. All who are in league with Satan will ultimately bow to the authority of Christ just as these these demons did. Now, they asked not to be sent out of the country. The parallel accounts in Matthew and in Luke, they say, do not send us into the abyss. And that seems to be an indication they're saying, we don't want you to cast us into torment now, into the lake of fire now. And here's the thing about it. When the Lord returns and we are found in rebellion toward him, we will be cast into the abyss, so to speak. We'll be cast into the lake of fire. And so, Satan is not going to be able to protect us, and he will not deliver us on the day of judgment. So we need to submit to the authority of Christ now before it's everlasting too late. Now, the other thing I want us to notice in verses 18 to 20, as this man has been uh, gotten rid of the demons in him. The Lord has blessed him. He goes to the Lord and wants to travel with the Lord, but the Lord tells him no. And just a quick lesson on this, you know, there are things that we may want that we ask of the Lord that they're good even of themselves, but it may not be the best thing to do. So the Lord tells this man, go and tell people what I've done for you. Tell people the blessings of God that you have received. And he goes and he does that and he tells it far and wide. So there are times we may ask for something from the Lord. It's not what's best for us, but the Lord will always do what's best. And we have to trust in that reality, that truth. Well, something else before we close out. Notice how after Jesus cast the demons out of this man, that word from the witnesses gets back to town and is spread throughout the country, and people come out to see what had happened. 
And when they get there, it says that they are afraid and they ask Jesus to leave. And then Jesus left. Now, here's a lesson for us. Jesus will not stay where he is not wanted. Okay. The Lord wants volunteers. Psalm 110 talks about there would be volunteers when Jesus would sit and rule and reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords as he is now. In Revelation 22, 17, it says, whoever desires, let him come and take of the water of life freely. We have to desire the Lord in our life. We have to voluntarily submit to his will. He will not force himself upon us. So we have to willingly go to him. We have to willingly submit to the Lord in our lives. And we need to appreciate the fact that he gives us an opportunity to submit to him. And instead of rejecting him when that opportunity is presented, we need to take advantage of it and embrace the Lord, submit to his will and receive the forgiveness that is found in him. These people here in Gadara, the Gadarenes, they reject Jesus in Mark chapter 5. Now, if you go forward into Mark 6, Jesus goes back to this side of the Sea of Galilee and the people warmly receive him. They bring many sick people out to him. So it seems that word has spread and there are those who appreciate the power of the Lord and the compassion that he has and the ability to help them. But let's understand this. These people, they ended up getting a second opportunity. And in our lives, we may get a second and a third opportunity. But here's a fact. One day, it will be our last opportunity. It'll be our last opportunity either because we die or because the Lord returns. So don't let time get away from you and you reach that last opportunity in your life and reject the Lord. But that opportunity is before you even now that you need to make up your mind that you're going to serve the Lord and we want to help you in serving the Lord. If you have not submitted in your life, we invite you to reach out to us and we want to study with you and help you to understand what it is that you must do in order to submit to the will of God, which would include hearing, believing, repenting, confessing uh, uh, Jesus is the Christ and being baptized to have your sins washed away. And we want to help you to do that so that you can rejoice and you can then go and tell others the great blessing that God has given to you. Yeah.